Whoa. Go. What? Agla, New York, population zero, is one of the most famous paper towns in America. Look at this. Paper town is a thing that map makers would put on their maps, so if they were being reprinted illegally. This is literally a line, and I remember, I can say it exactly. It's a fake city that map makers would put on their maps, so then if they get copied illegally, then they'd know. There's a famous example of this among cartography nerds uh, called Aglo, New York. This town was invented by a company called the General Drafting Company in the 1930s, and then 40 years later, Rand McNally made a map with Aglo, New York on it. So General Drafting called them and said, we made that town up, we, made, we put it at the intersection of two random dirt roads, we're gonna sue your pants off. And Rand McNally was like, no, 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 Aglo is real. Because people kept going to that intersection of two dirt roads in the middle of nowhere, expecting there to be a place called Aglo, someone eventually built a place called Aglo. Aglo, New York, has become a real town. Now you can find it on maps and people know about it, so it's something that sort of has been created entirely out of projection. That was sort of an irresistible metaphor to me. Like, the way that we map our universe does end up shaping the universe itself. Hey, everyone, it's Ben Hughes here. Today's video is dedicated to John Green, New York Times best-selling author. This past weekend, I just happened to be staying in the Catskill Mountains just outside of where that fictional town supposedly is. So around 1 o'clock Eastern time on August 20th, 2010, the population of Aglo, New York, was one. Well, actually, three, if you count my brother and his fiance. They had no idea what I was talking about, but they were like, yeah, sure, we can go find a town that doesn't exist somewhere around here. We love the book. The fans love the book. The fan base is loyal and it's strong and it's amazing. They crowd up on the side of set, like where they're not allowed to be, but like they just crowd and they take pictures. And they're super nice, like they have no idea who I am. They, but they're like, Radar! And so I was like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm Radar, yeah. Fans are awesome. They love his books, they love him. He really captures what teenagers are going through in a very authentic way. It's crazy, John Green has the coolest fans. They're just a very, very astute fan base. They definitely were eagerly waiting the film every single day and anytime I posted anything. It's just great to have people that care so much and sometimes when you look at the comments on things, it's really fun to watch them kind of argue back and forth about what we're doing with the movie. And so there are these fans that are motivated enough to try to find Aglo, New York. Hey, guess where I am? Aglo, New York. At least I'm like 99.9% .9 certain that this is Aglo. I don't know if you guys know this, but finding a fake place is kind of hard. I could sing you a song I wrote a little while ago about Paper Town. People are complex and complexly misimagined. The girl next door is down the hall, more perfect than I can fathom. I look into her face, I think she's laughing, but she's crying. We drove down the road it's supposed to be on once, but we couldn't find it, so we went in, and we had lunch in this town close to it, and we asked the people there, but they had no idea. And then we asked a lady in an antique shop, and she called the town historian. And then she sent us to the railroad museum in the town, where we met this, like, 90-year-old man named Wilmer Sipple, who had been born here and used to be the historian, and he had no idea what we were talking about, but he was very intrigued. We showed him a little picture of a map that we found on Wikipedia of where it should be, and this is where he said it should be. So, I'm here, in Aglo. They were thinking that she'd leave me with nothing more than this idea of who she was. And so, John, for your birthday, I decided that I would put up this video showing you Aglo General Store. I don't know if you've ever been there. I don't know if you've ever seen the inside of it, but here we go. You're looking at this old rundown building, right? And to most people, it would look just like an old rundown building in the middle of Roscoe, New York. But if you've ever read Paper Towns, this is the general store at Aglo, New York. If you're really a John Green fanatic and nerd fighter and want the location, there's a Google map in the doobly-doo. So yay, this is Aglo. It's delightful. I love New York. I'm gonna go hang out with my parents now. Thank you guys for watching. I will talk to you guys later. It's Ben Hughes here, obviously. I enjoyed making the Fault in Our Stars movie so much. And my feeling was, if this is gonna happen again, I really want it to be a lot of the same people because I, I like these people, I trust these people, I know them very well. So we were really fortunate that Paper Towns has the same studio, the same producers, down to the costume designer and the music supervisor, and of course Nat Wolf, who played Isaac in The Fault in Our Stars and is the star of this movie, uh, Quentin Jacobson. I had talked to the screenwriters of Fault in Our Stars and I had asked them would they be interested in adapting it. Basically like, let's get the team back together and make another movie together. And Scott and Mike said yes and Nat said he wanted to do it. So I said, great, let's go. All the things that you want in the world are way out there. Nat read the book Paper Towns while he was making The Fault in Our Stars. He came up to me and said, I love this book, I really want to play Q. And I love that idea because Nat is a close friend of mine and also an actor I admire a lot. 
Well, it was really watching him in Fault in Our Stars and getting to know him on that movie set. And something just made me go, gosh, I should give him this book because he'd be a perfect cue. Can't do that. It's kind of Quentin's coming of age story, and he is somebody who plays it safe, makes a lot of plans, and through the process of the movie, he learns to take chances and to open up, which sounds like every movie ever made, but this is a very good example of it. I have plans and goals, none of which involve jail or dying. Paper Towns is the first time we've written a screenplay knowing who our lead actor was gonna be before we started, and the fact that it was Nat who we worked with on Fault in Our Stars was incredible for us. We already knew he can handle anything. He's hilarious, dramatic. The gifts he has already, even as a young actor, it's really incredible. So for us, it made our job easier because we knew anything we threw at him, he could not only handle, but in fact, make better. I can't believe you just did that. We bring the rain down on our enemies. We? You'll see. Knowing that we had Q in place, that was great. And then obviously Margot is going to be an immensely tricky casting decision. Margot Roth Spiegelman is this larger than life girl, but she also has to be somewhat grounded in reality. She's got to be pretty impulsive, a little bit crazy, a kind of terrifying edge to her, but also she has to be fully human. What we knew was most important was that we honor Margot's energy. Who is the girl that comes to your window at midnight that you will jump out that window for, that you will drive 1,200 miles to go find? Who motivates that to happen? Who has so much energy that she can wrap everyone up in her orbit? And Carl walked into the room, and it happened to the room. The similarities between me and Margot is kind of weird. When I went into the audition for the first time, I just said, I was like, look, I've done a lot of these things. This is really weird. I used to be like that. This is that something I've done. Who down there? I think you'd be hard pressed to find somebody um, more Margot than, than Kara is. And from her early auditions, there was just that kind of elusive, fascinating quality to her that only a few people ever in real life possess. Strong female character is an honest female character, which is multifaceted and has lots of faults and lots of great things about them. Yeah. Yeah. And that would be uh, the very multi. Uh, faceted uh, Margot. There's a great line in a Philip Roth book, the thing isn't about owning a person, the thing is about having a contender in the room with you. And it's hard to be a contender in the room with someone like Nat Wolf, and it's hard to be a contender in the room with someone like Cara Delevingne, but, but they are truly that for each other. They challenge each other, they raise each other's game on every level, and it's pretty wonderful to watch them be together. Here's a tip, Quentin. You're cute when you're confident, less when you're not. There's this long-standing construction in storytelling of the manic pixie dream girl, this girl who enters into the life of a boy and transforms his life and then usually disappears in a convenient way so that the boy can live happily ever after because the girl isn't relevant to the story. From the moment I saw her, I was hopelessly, madly in love. In Paper Towns, I wanted to get at the idea that this romanticization of, of young women that we do when we imagine them as manic pixie dream girls is destructive not just to the girls involved, but also to the boys who are imagining them. I wanted to talk about how important it is to imagine everybody complexly, to acknowledge that no one is merely a manic pixie dream girl, no one is merely any one thing. People have always looked at me and seen what they wanted to see. People, as Walt Whitman famously wrote, contain multitudes. I love John's writing style. He writes and develops these really well-rounded characters. The myth of Margot Roth Spiegelman. But it's just a fantasy. As the story progresses, more and more layers are peeled back from all of the people, including the women. Angela's gonna come with us. It's really cool to shatter the idea that people are one-dimensional. This is uh, definitely the craziest thing I will ever do in my life. Not if I can help it. I was so struck by it, how much it connected with my own high school experiences in a way that was both kind of fun and also sort of uh, maybe more painful to remember than I, than I wanted it to be, but I thought that it just had such an interesting message about the way we can project images onto other people and how hard it can be to live up to those images. No one ever looks at me and thinks that I'm smart or clever or interesting, you know? I have a brain. I'm going to Dartmouth. This age isn't all about one thing, but it's about everything happening to you at once, and it's like crazy, and it's happening for the first time, and it's exciting, but I think he really captures the spirit of that age. 
John brought us a wonderful love story and drama in Fault in Our Stars, and I think this book was one of his earlier books. It was much more about the joy and excitement of being a teenager and the sort of the, the pursuit of the girl, the fun with your friends, that sense of high school coming to an end and a journey's about to begin that you're not quite ready for. He's been a beer for a while. Ben has a very uh, impulsive sort of nature to him. I thought it would be interesting just because it's the sort of teenager that you see a lot. I thought it would be interesting to sort of understand that more. You guys work together as a screenwriting team. That seems very weird to me. Which of you does the actual writing and which of you is just the, uh, the like, good looking one? <laughs> When we read John's books, we come at it as fans first. When we want to do an adaptation, we think about what we fell in love with, what the audience loves, and how best to encapsulate the voice of the book uh, as cinematically as we can. My priority with the movie adaptation is not that all the plot be there, that every scene from the book end up in the movie. It's that the ideas uh, from the story end up in the movie, that the themes get translated to this visual medium. I just loved the visual potential that was in the book. It was just so easy to see the way the visuals could connect and could really drive the characters through the story. I've got liquids. You? Tortilla chips, beef jerky, pretzels, peanuts, milk duds, twizzlers. Got it. I think Jake Schreier, the director of Paper Towns, has just done an amazing job. He's read the book so carefully and so thoughtfully, and he understands it so deeply. And all the stuff that really matters to me, at least personally, he's finding ways to bring visual life to. That's something I could never do. I have absolutely no talent for this, so I'm just in awe of him. Every actor should have the chance to work with Jake. I mean, he knows exactly what he wants for the movie, and he's, he's passionate. He's a, like a real artist. He's super passionate, and he's in it with you at all times. Jake is just incredibly confident in everything he does. There's other confident directors, but for some reason, he's just so, like, you know he's gonna make something good. I'm the greatest, I shook up the world! On this film, we've had so much freedom to write what we wanna write, say the lines we wanna say. He's just so open to our suggestions. I would say with casting, we don't pay a lot of attention to what people think the character should be. But what's most important to us when we cast a movie is capturing actors that embody the spirit of the character. Jake Schreier, our director, had a vision from the very beginning that we all get apartments in the same building so that we could all live together. And it kind of, you know, it blurred a little bit the lines between onset and offset, and it gave everything uh, an incredible air of truth. Life translated into the movie very well, making it so that the movie became the life. What's been really great is how strangely close all the dynamics of the cast are with the characters in the movie. The cast is like a family, and I know like a lot of people say that a lot of times, but it's really, really genuine. We hang out with each other all the time, offset, and so when we're actually like together on set, it's so easy, like we can improv easily. I'm just so glad that like that we like each other. I'm just really glad that we like each other. A number of the jokes in the film, they came up with themselves and a lot of it was, I mean, if you saw those kids off set, they were playing pranks on each other, they all sleep on each other's couches in each other's rooms, playing video games. I mean, you really, really couldn't separate them. They're like best friends and they love each other. And it, it was a perfect fit. The worst thing is gonna be finishing this film because it's like a family you've made and then suddenly you're not really gonna see them that much anymore, it's really sad. We're about to wrap in a few days and I'm getting really upset because these are my friends now, you know? And it's like summer camp, you don't wanna leave. They've become the tight-knit group that I'd always hoped that, that they would be. I think that they'll be friends for the rest of their lives and I know that it's gonna be great for me to be able to root for them for the rest of their lives because they're all people I'm excited to root for. Hey, buddy. Oh, I cried so much yesterday. It's the most I cried in, like, about a year and a half. Yeah, this is the most I've cried since a lot of the scenes where I had to cry. <laughs> <laughs> to have John on set is really amazing. It just brings, like, everyone's level, like, up to here. He's been here every day on set, watching, laughing, feeling a lot, as he tends to do. 
Part of having John Green on set is a constant reminder of the energy around his books and his persona. And so they do realize that they're going to be making a movie that audiences are going to flock to. You have John Green there and you can talk to him not just about what's in the book, but how did he imagine it or is there a way he could see it differently and now how can we make it the best that it can be? I don't know if anybody is more excited about this film than John is. Anytime we do a scene, I'll go back and I'll see John and he is just so thrilled and surprised and amazed that his story is being brought to life. He's such a wonderful person and he's so funny and he is kind of a cheerleader for the actors. You know, a lot of times you're doing scenes and everybody's just worried about if you're gonna finish on time and all of a sudden he's like, guys, we're making a movie. Can you believe it? <laughs> Hi, I'm John Green. I'm the author of the book Paper Towns, which is now being turned into a movie. I'm here with Rosiana Rojas, who uh, is my assistant, but also is one of the first readers of Paper Towns. Yes, very early, early reader. And we are going to now go on a tour of the Paper Towns set. Awesome. We're here on the stage. Perfect. I know, I'm excited. A lot of the book takes place, as I'm sure you remember, in an abandoned mini mall. Isn't this cool? It's amazing. It's so weird. It's so creepy. Oh, God. I always worry that I'm going to step on something that's important to the yeah. movie. <laughs> They're gonna be like, oh, everything was fine until John Green walked in. You've got these, uh, the beams, the single beams of light coming in, the open. So it's been very carefully destroyed. It's been beautifully destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. And then you will go to the paper towns and you will never come back. Wow. There at the back. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it weird how it becomes real? It just feels like someone has completely abandoned this place. I know, but in fact, they built it like six weeks ago. There's the troll hole. Nice. And then on the other side that's is quite, the- That's quite tiny to crawl through. I know it's smaller than the actual troll hole, but yeah. I think it's cinematically better. This is the office. It's massive. On the other side of the troll hole. Yeah, there's where it actually says troll hole. Now we're going to leave the troll hole, uh, and we are going to go over to Margo and Q's houses. So this is the bathroom. Did I show you that? Isn't that weird? Like, it doesn't look like a bathroom. No. But it will in the movie. But I mean that you walk out the mini mall. Oh, and yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, from yeah, the bathroom. yeah. You walk out of the mini mall and you're like, what is this fantastic bathtub? This is a very nice bathtub. I would totally have this bathtub in my house. I'm a little jealous. I understand why Lacey sits in the bathtub because it's Yeah, like it's a amazing. Palace. Yeah. It's a palace. Right. What was so exciting about having John as a producer on the film was that he really just wanted to make a great movie. You know, that his, his thoughts and his views on it were not connected to trying to protect his work so much as be excited to be involved in making a new work that was born from his work. He was mostly concerned that the movie was faithful to the ideas and the spirit of the book more than being faithful to detail. Day 27 of 34, so we're near the end of the shoot, and today is the gas station scene. This has been a really fun day for the cast, and also for me, I have to say, almost everyone from the cast is here, and it's been really fun to spend the day with them and just, like, run around a convenience store that's closed. If you could imagine a novelist, it could be the worst thing in the world for him to watch some kids, you know, ruin his book. But he's, like, he's in it with us, and he trusts us. Sometimes when we ask him questions about the character, he tells us we know the character more than he does, which makes a lot of sense. Like, that actually helps me a lot because I get to make the choices, I get to decide, like, how Radar would react here and here and here. He's also very open-minded. He's not stuck on anything in the book. He's really open to changes and to how a scene is going and changing it so that it works a little bit better. You, know, you realize the only reason we make fun of the Flash is because there is nothing else in your performance that we can hold on to, to, to ridicule. How good is that? How good do you have to be where people are like, you're not good at holding a flashlight, yeah. right? You know who else wasn't good at holding a flashlight? Marlon Brando. <laughs> that is not a fact. I just knew that's where I was going. It's so weird, like I wrote the book all those years ago and now people like reading the book being like, so what's Making this house the window like? that she yeah. she climbs through. So this you... is Q's house. And that's where Margot like runs up, that's his bedroom window. So they can get that shot of her on the roof. Yeah. But then how do they get the full house? The rest of it was shot outside. In a real house. In a real house that looks exactly like that house. Wow. I appreciate how hard they're working to get it right or yeah. to make it feel real because it is what the story's gonna be for a lot of people. That's why I wanted to be on set instead of being a regular author. So now we are gonna go into Quentin's bedroom um, and see what he has inside of his bedroom. So this is Q's room. Uh, my favorite band, The Mountain Goats, featured prominently above Q's bed, as well they should be. You had to get them in somewhere. I tried really hard. I asked Jake specifically if that poster could be in the movie. Oh, yes. he's got your books. He does have my books. Quentin is a, uh, 
He's a certified reader of Paper Towns, which is a very difficult and meta idea to get your head around. He must have been reading it and been like, oh my gosh, this is very familiar. I'm in the Truman Show right now. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty weird. <laughs> I did, like, he's really good at science fairs. All of his trophies are oh, science, science fair, fair trophies, fair. whereas all of Jace's trophies uh, are, like, for being really good at baseball. Right. So this is Quentin's bathroom, which I don't think you ever actually see in the movie. Okay. But my favorite part about Quentin's bathroom, besides the fact that the toilet definitely does not work, um, is that you come out of Quentin's bathroom and what? Movie you, magic. You are in a warehouse. Yeah. Movie magic. Sweet. I could totally live in Quentin's apartment. Any of these places. This place is literally nicer than uh, my first apartment in Chicago. By yeah. Way, it's bigger. It's, it's definitely clean. cleaner. Yeah. I was looking at the hardwood floors. I was like, these hardwood floors would be completely acceptable to me in my new home. Yeah. Overall, I feel like Quentin has a slightly better quality of life than I do, and that seems okay. unfair. Because okay. he's only 17. Yeah. I have so many great memories uh, from the time that I've spent on this movie set. It's hard to pick just one. I and mean, all the times I've been out to dinner with the cast and everybody is, have been really special. I guess the best times for me have been the days when the whole cast was here together. The strange, wonderful feeling of seeing a world that I had previously only imagined come to visual life. And that's kind of what the book Paper Towns is about. It's about how we imagine things and then they become real. And now I'm experiencing imagining something and see it become real. It's just crazy.